Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. And we're going to get started here. This is uh, this is Gary Lackman. Um, he's a DTC visitor here, uh, kind of split between Jamie Wolf and I, um, doing some work with uh, snow bands uh, while he's visiting us. But today he's not going to talk on that topic. He's going to he's going to speak of this topic on the screen, which is Hurricane Joaquin and the South Carolina flood of uh, this past October. Um, Gary uh, grew up in the Seattle area and went to UW for uh, bachelor's and master's and before going on to Albany to get a to get his PhD and then a little bit of a stint of postdoc at uh, at all at uh, McGill and now he is has been a professor at NC State for how long uh, now? 17 years 17 years so uh, <laughs> Gary was at my house yesterday and my daughter thought he looked too young to be a professor so <laughs> he took that as a pretty big compliment coming from my 19 year old daughter so anyway without any further ado then Gary please Okay, thanks, thanks, Greg. And uh, yeah, I think your daughter also mentioned that she had some very ancient professors, so it was sort of complimented by comparison. But I was still very, uh, very flattered by that. Uh, well, thank you for being here, and uh, thanks to uh, Greg and Jamie for the invitation to come and uh, give a seminar and, and visit this week. Um, as Greg said, I'm here talking about uh, or researching snow bands, but talking about um, hurricanes. So. Uh, or at least heavy rainstorms. So the the focus of this, uh, there's some interesting stories about sort of how I got into this particular case study, um, and I'll get into that a little bit. But I should first point out that uh, my former graduate student, Chris Marciano, did uh, a fair bit of the work that I'll be sharing with you today. So I wanted to give him uh, equal billing as a, a co-author, a co-presenter. Um, I'll just cut to the chase and introduce the cast of characters uh, Hurricane Joaquin uh, was the second major of uh, the Atlantic 2015 Atlantic season. Uh, it had a non-tropical origin, which is uh, an interesting different story. Formed in late September, uh, it lasted a couple of weeks, but it was sort of an extra tropical mode after about the 8th of October. Um, its peak intensity was category four with uh, 155 mile an hour winds and 931 millibar minimum central pressure. Almost all of the fatalities associated with the storm were the sinking of the, the freighter SS Alfero, which broke in half and sank in the Bahamas when it was there. Um, and the total price tag on this storm uh, was uh, slightly over $120 million, according to the Wikipedia page. Um, there's a lot of interesting aspects that we could really delve into with this. as a tricky track forecast. Uh, as a North Carolina resident, we were very... Uh, interested and concerned uh, when some of the late September forecasts made landfall uh, from South Carolina up through North Carolina, uh, eventually uh, points northward. But then the observed track shown down here in the, uh, let's see, where's my cursor? Uh, okay, maybe, oh, here we go. Yeah, so it sort of did a loop and then it stayed well offshore and went out to sea. So there's another challenge for uh, the numerical guidance. Um, but you know, we won't get into the whole modeling aspect, ECMWF consistently offshore, it's a different story. Um, but meanwhile, while the storm was really uh, amplifying over the Bahamas, very heavy precipitation began to fall over South Carolina and the, and the Southeast U.S. in general um, on September 30th and uh, October 1st. So Switching gears, the second character is the uh, South Carolina flood that took place between the 1st and 5th of October 2015, at the same time that Joaquin was uh, offshore to the southeast. And, uh, you know, they're up to two foot rainfall totals here. I, I don't know how well you can see the numbers on this map, but some of these totals, uh, 23 inches, I think the peak total anywhere in a gauge was 20, over 26, almost 27 inches of rain in a five day period. And so the flooding was, was catastrophic. So uh, the price tag for the flood was two orders of magnitude greater than Joaquin. You know, it was 12 billion plus dollar storm. And I went down to Columbia, uh, South Carolina and, and presented some of this work in March. And you know, the people are still sort of stunned by the water levels and how much flooding took place. Um, you know, there were levee and dam uh, failures, huge amount of uh, transportation disruption due to washed out and flooded roads, contaminated water supplies, 
and uh, 25 fatalities with the with the flooding event. So very high impact event. And you know, look at when you look at this map. I mean, you say, oh, the people, you know, the green areas. You know, the green areas are two to four inches of rain in five days. So everyone in the whole state saw very heavy rainfall, but the people in the in the purple shaded areas, um, you know, had over 20 inches of rain. Um, so when this happened, um, big headlines, of course. Uh, but you see the headline in the Wall Street Journal, flooding from Hurricane Joaquin shuts roads, schools in South Carolina. Seven dead as Hurricane Joaquin brings chaotic flooding, record-breaking downpours. So you know, the media saw, okay, there's this Cat 4 hurricane out there, and then there's this flood. You know, people kind of treated it like the hurricane made landfall, and this is kind of what happened. And of course, it wasn't quite like that. Um, if you look at the, uh, the AccuWeather summary, from their web page, you know, you had this feed of tropical moisture coming in, and then you had this other Joaquin moisture. Uh, then there was kind of a, a cold air damming event with cold air coming down from the north. Uh, there was this upper level low over the south. A very complicated uh, environment. They also mentioned the above normal sea surface temperatures off the east coast. So there's a lot going on uh, that sort of contributed to the flood. But this idea that Joaquin was influencing the event kept coming up. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia page, it says that this upper level low uh, tapped into moisture from the nearby Hurricane Joaquin, uh, which uh, helped fuel the flooding. If you look at the National Hurricane Center summary, uh, they say that this upper level low drew a steady plume of upper level moisture from Joaquin northwestward into South Carolina, and this moisture contributed to a multi-day rainfall event that caused historic flooding. Yeah, this, you know, upper level moisture, you know, the, most of the moisture is at lower levels, but still, you know, the, the satellite imagery was, was suggestive of this, and I'll show some of that in a minute. Um, you know, if you look at these reports, there were many more from different storm summaries that came out, but the idea behind a lot of these reports, they were suggesting that Joaquin was in some way exporting moisture to help fuel this flooding event, and that's kind of the idea that I was uh, interested in examining. Uh, because, you know, you know from um, water budget studies of hurricanes that uh, precipitation greatly exceeds evaporation and there's strongly convergent flow. So a lot of the water vapor is funneling into the system and being removed as precipitation. And so, you know, how, how does it work where a hurricane then can export moisture to some place a thousand kilometers downstream? You know, that's something that I was sort of you know, curious about. So. You know, in the deep tropics, a tropical cyclone is a net moisture sink. But you know, the thing that's interesting in this case, uh, of course, the TC wind field does increase evaporation, which could add moisture over the larger area, and some of that moisture could be channeled into the flooding area. Um, but also, the, the moisture budget studies are more complicated when you move into a complex synoptic environment. So it could be that the kind of deep tropics moisture budgets aren't as relevant for a system that's moving into uh, higher latitudes with uh, synoptic weather systems interacting. So that's sort of the backdrop for the, the things I was curious about when this event happened. Also, my friend who was on TV in the area, uh, you know, when he was reporting it on the news, he was saying, okay, you know, it may or may not be Joaquin. So they actually brought me over there and put a microphone in front of me and said, well, how will you find out if Joaquin caused this flooding or not? And I said something, oh, well, we can run some model simulations. Uh, and so I won't show you the clip of me on the news because it's, it's terrible. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's what I ended up doing. Um, but there's also a whole, there's a lot of study that's gone on where you get these heavy precipitation events that are in the vicinity or downstream of tropical cyclones, and they have a nice acronym, the PREES, the predecessor rain events. And the uh, people at Albany and others, uh, including Russ Schumacher up the way here at Colorado State, have studied these. And um, you know, you have, you know, here's kind of the schematic from the uh, uh, Cote uh, Masters thesis, where you have a tropical cyclone, and they drew it right over Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, <laughs> But you know, then down, so you have the precipitation with the tropical cyclone, but then you have um, this upper level jet and in the right entrance you get some lift. You can get these convective events, precipitation events that take place downstream of the cyclone. 
And that has a lot of impact because if you get heavy rains and then the tropical cyclone comes in, then the ground is already saturated, you know, trees uproot more easily, it's easier to get a, a catastrophic flood. So these have been studied. Um, the definition that Galarno et al, and you know, Tom used to be here as well, now he's at Arizona right now. So, But he, um, in their 2010 paper, they said, okay, it has to have the, the pre precipitation event has to have clear separation from the tropical cyclone precipitation shield. You have to have at least four inches of rain in 24 hours. Uh, you have to have sustained reflect radar reflectivity of 35 dBZ for at least six hours. So it has to be a long, it can't just be a diurnal flare up of convection. And then the, qu the last quote here may be the most difficult to establish. Uh, deep tropical moisture directly associated with the TC must be affected away from the TC into the region of heavy rainfall. And so that's sort of the thing that came up with Joaquin. Is Joaquin a pre, you know, it's, it meets all of these conditions, but this last one we have to try to establish. And, um, you know, the quote is that this distinguishing characteristic is that they are sustained by moisture from the TC. And so, yeah, you know, how do we establish that? Um, so here's some, some of the papers that have looked at this. The Schumacher et al. 2011 paper was a good one in that they actually removed some of the moisture with Tropical Storm Aaron to see how that affected the downstream uh, convection. But it's difficult to know how much moisture is truly attributable to the tropical cyclone versus what would have been there anyway. So I'll try to address that with, with Joaquin. I'll let you, you guys can be the judge if I succeed in that. Um, so the... Uh, that's kind of the science questions, or what are the fundamental connections between tropical cyclones and these pre's? And in particular for this case, uh, was Joaquin a moisture source for the heavy rainfall? And also, I mentioned that in the schematic of the pre that there was that upper level jet. You know, the outflow, the upper level outflow from a hurricane can enhance that jet and dictate where and how strong the synoptic scale forcing for ascent is as well. So that's another way that a TC can influence the rainfall event. So does it matter? You know, you might say, well, you know, this is kind of a semantic argument. You know, are there reasons why we really care whether the event was associated with the, the TC or not? Now, maybe there's some insurance reasons. If you're a homeowner, you know, and you can say, okay, it was the hurricane-related flooding and I have hurricane insurance. Um, you know, there's $12 billion worth of settlement to... Yeah, but that's not where we're going. I think, uh, and you could probably come up with other reasons why it matters. You might say, well, it doesn't matter. But the reason I think it matters that is especially interesting um, from a predictability standpoint is that if the, if the pre or the predecessor rain event is really tied directly to the tropical cyclone, then the prediction of pre's will depend on accurate tropical cyclone intensity and track forecasts. And we know that there's difficulty with that. And so uh, if the pre is really directly linked to the tropical cyclone, then the model forecasts have to get the tropical cyclone right to get the pre right. At least that's, that's possible. We want to investigate that. So that's sort of the, the scientific backdrop. Um, so let's look at some observations. Greg will like this. I got this from his page. So to just zoom in, so here's the Raleigh. So this is a couple of days before things really got going, but I just wanted to point out that 77 degree dew point. This is late September. Now you don't, you, you, if you in Boulder, you never see that. So, <laughs> uh, um, and you're, you're lucky, but I mean, you're proud of a 70 degree dew point in July. Late September, you've got a 77 dew point. And if you look down here, you've got places that have 80 degree dew points, late September. So an incredibly humid air mass is in place before this event gets going. Um, then um, what happened, um, the, a kind of a cold high pressure system moved in, a front moved, uh, pushed offshore, we had some weak cold air damming set up, so there was this cold dome, and then look at the dew points, still very high offshore, and this whole system ended up pushing inland as a warm front, but you had a lot of lift as the moist flow off the Atlantic rode up and over that cold dome, so kind of a classic uh, pre-setup. And uh, just, I used IDV a little bit. Um, so I should have picked a cold colored. The, the gold is a uh, potential temperature isosurface that kind of shows that cold dome. 
and then the green is a mixing ratio or specific humidity isosurface and then I put the low level wind field on there so you can see that this moist flow is being lifted up and over the cold dome. Then the white contours show the upper level, the 200 millibar height, so you can see this upper trough negatively tilted and so giving a lot of lift in this area from the upper level system. So a pretty potent, um, pretty potent setup. And then of course, we have to mention Joaquin is out here and there's a lot of moisture that seems to be circulating around, kind of pointing in that direction. Um, also, the upper level jet, here's an isosurface of uh, isotac, uh, 75 knots. So you can see this beautiful anticyclonically curved upper level jet. You can just imagine a great right jet entrance in here with a lot of lift and then all this moisture coming in. So everything is lining up for a historic uh, rainfall event. And uh, to show that a little better, um, this shows an old fashioned gym pack plot of uh, uh, the shading is the ice attacks and the winds at the 250 millibar level. Here's the state of South Carolina. The red dashed lines are omega, so you can see, I mean, look at these, the winds are just really cutting across the height lines uh, towards lower heights, a really strong anticyclonically curved jet, and then that right entrance is just right over the place that had the heavy precipitation. So a really uh, potent setup, but of course that outflow, the jet that you see there uh, to the west could be part and due to uh, the outflow from Joaquin. So maybe that's uh, another role. Um, here's the water vapor loop. Of course, this isn't showing lower tropospheric water vapor, but it shows the upper troposphere. And uh, so you can kind of see the proximity of the tropical cyclone down here. And you can see the, uh, the cold uh, cloud tops a bit. We'll let it run through one more time. So you can see this um, convection getting going here. Then this thing kind of rotates in and then right during this time is when there was really intense rainfall across uh, South Carolina. But you can see that, you know, there's the connection is a little bit tenuous. And again, we're looking at upper levels here where there's not a lot of water vapor content. So what we do, uh, what I did here to try to resolve this uh, was try to run a simulation that captured the event in this complex setup and then analyze where the moisture is coming from and, and kind of looking at the uh, synoptic, dynamic, and mesoscale environments in that control simulation and then remove Joaquin and repeat to see how much difference. Did the flood still happen without Joaquin? Uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, you know, so the first thing, and this is you know, Chris Marciano, my gra former grad student, who now works at uh, ARA. You know, we just said, oh, let's just start off with a simple model run, just initialize with the GFS. We'll start off with 36, then nest down to 12 and 4 kilometers. But we always start with the 36 just to see, because if the 36 is out to lunch, then you don't want to bother wasting all the uh, time running the high res. And uh, but it turned out the 36, as I hope to convince you, was was reasonably good, um, and I won't go through all the details here, um, but uh, this is kind of the, the setup. We tried initializing at 0z the 29th, 0z the 30th, and 0z the 1st, and the first time we got a decent uh, control simulation of the track of Joaquin was when we initialized at 0z on the 1st. The other uh, 29th and 30th gave us landfalls along the east coast. But I should point out that, so we used the GFS to initialize. And the GFS run from that initial condition produced a landfall in New Jersey. So um, that was interesting that because uh, we were basically using the same initial conditions. And as you'll see, we didn't get landfall in New Jersey. Um, so here's our control simulation, simulated radar. I've circled South Carolina. It moves pretty quickly. And uh, so it, you know, this is just a five-day um, and I should point out this simulated reflectivity does include the contributions from the convective scheme. Um, we use the teeth key uh, scheme for this. And um, so, you know, on the, so that was encouraging. It looked a bit like what we expected. So here's the observed radar composite reflectivity over here. Here's the, uh, the simulated radar. And I'll slow, I slow it down at a couple points. So I'll, I'll show you a still. Unless you're really good at looking back and forth really quickly, 
Now, this might not be that useful, but it, it shows that the, the overall scenario over South Carolina was reasonably well captured. So this is the real heavy hitting point overnight, uh, the night of the third into the morning of the fourth. So you had this, uh, this band that was quasi-stationary of just intense convection with incredible rainfall rates. And you know, lo and behold, um, you know, our out-of-the-box 36-kilometer wharf simulation you know, had something like that. It even seems to kind of have some of these other, uh, you know, other features you know, represented a little bit. But you know, it's uh, you know, a coarse simulation, kind of our first cut. But when we looked at the precipitation totals, um, the stage four analysis is on the left, and the uh, corresponding wharf simulation is on the right. Um, you know, it's pretty pretty darn good for an out of the box 36 kilometer initialized with GFS. We we're very happy with this. Um, it almost seemed fortuitous that it worked so well, but um, that's what we got. And if we look at the track of Joaquin. The best track is black, the, our control simulation is in red, so it's a little closer to the coast than observed, but you know, overall, again, we were you know, quite pleased with that. Where we failed was in the intensity, and so this, this could be viewed as the main criticism of what I'll show you today, and that is, even though the, the track was right and the rainfall over South Carolina was decent, the intensity of Joaquin was too weak, and that's we we probably could have bogus and you know we haven't played around with that yet we certainly can use tc.exe to get it stronger but in a way this gives it kind of the more generic structure and also at higher resolution of course we would get much more intensity and i have other runs with higher resolution that did capture more of the intensity so um for if any of you are fans of the dynamic tropopause uh, so this shows the shading, the color shading, yellow and blue are potential temperature on the dynamic tropopause with winds. So this is the, uh, I think the one and a half PVU isosurface. And so the cool colors show the upper level trough that ended up cutting off and helping give synoptic scale ascent. Then the yellow warm colors, that's really capturing the outflow from Joaquin. So you can see um, the really strong development of this anticyclonic flow with time. I'll let it loop through one more time. And um, so if you watch here, you have southwesterly flow, and you see kind of some of the yellow contours in here develop. So that shows kind of a non-conservation. You can really see that anticyclonic flow developing that thins the trough and causes it to sort of pinch off to the south. So that's, you know, kind of consistent with diabatic processes and a lot of latent heat release to give you that warming and ridging up on the tropopause, uh, which seemed to do a lot to thin that upstream trough. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this lower tropospheric view here because we'll zoom in on that more later, but the green is specific humidity and the red is the low level potential vorticity and then you can see that moisture feed coming in. So here's Joaquin and here's this feed of moisture into South Carolina and uh, you know, we'll analyze that a little bit more. Um, so the, this is hour 78 of our simulation. The, uh, the 900 millibar moisture flux vectors are shown in blue and then the uh, composite simulated reflectivity so you can see this band of precipitation extending into South Carolina. And if we overlay on that the moisture flux convergence we see that uh, as we would hope and expect that the moisture flux convergence at 900 millibars matches pretty well with the precipitation, the uh, composite reflectivity. But the thing we were interested in is sort of this moisture feed. So now we've, we've, we're looking above and towards uh, the, the northwest. So the red contour here is a potential vorticity isosurface. So there's this lower tropospheric band of potential vorticity that lines up with this area of rainfall and moisture flux and uh, moisture flux convergence. And so this is probably a diabatically produced PV anomaly and you'd, if you expect there's cyclonic flow associated with this, that would be driving a southeasterly low-level jet and really fueling that moisture transport to the north and west of that band. And if you put the moisture transport uh, magnitude isosurface on there, you can see that it's nestled in just like you would expect on kind of the cyclonic side of that lower PV maximum. And so that's sort of the story that, that diabet there's a feedback going on. You have precipitation, which is helping to strengthen this feature, 
And then that uh, PV feature is associated with this low-level jet that's really driving the moisture transport. So you get, it's like a typical atmospheric river case. where That's what happens in these events. Um, we calculated the parameterized latent heating, and we took a cross-section. So this, the red on here is showing latent heat release parameterized, and the blue shows the PV. So if we take a north-south cross-section and look westward, then we can see this in a little more detail, kind of the structure of that moisture transport. So now the potential vorticity is shown in the warm colors. We switch that up. Um, so here's this lower tropospheric PV maximum. It's completely separate from what's happening up at the tropopause. So this is a very isolated uh, PV maximum. The green contours are the diabetic PV tendency, and the vectors show the non-advective PV flux. And so there's a lot of PV flux convergence and diabetic PV growth. So all this does is confirm that that potential vorticity feature is diabetic in origin. It's separate from the, I probably didn't need to prove that to, to people, but that's, that shows it. But the thing that's interesting is if you then take the PV in red and put the moisture flux, uh, the section normal moisture flux, I mean, there's a real close association here. That feature is really what's driving the low level jet and driving the heavy precipitation. And so that's uh, an interesting feature. Will that be there without Joaquin is, is what we'll find out uh, in a minute. So that's sort of the, the low level moisture transport uh, side of the story. So everyone's waiting, uh, anticipating, okay, this is the one, the one uh, piece of entertainment in this. What happens without Joaquin? Well, first of all, how do we take out Joaquin? We, we could use the Wharf uh, TC, um, that exe feature. Uh, instead, we did we used uh, first PV and then ultimately geostrophic vorticity inversion because we wanted to get uh, due to lower boundary conditions uh, issues that we had with the PV inversion. Uh, but I think we can still do better uh, with a full PV inversion. But this worked this worked fine as you'll see. So we basically inverted all the geostrophic vorticity except that which we deemed associated with Joaquin, and that gave us the height field without Joaquin in it. And then from the heights, you could get the hydrostatic temperature and so forth. So we were able to do it that way. We also uh, tried uh, doing sort of an anomaly removal where we took a deviation from a zonal average and applied an E-folding distance. Uh, so we did it several different ways. Uh, they all worked you know, reasonably well. But in the end, we used this uh, digital filter initialization to make sure that what we were putting into the model initial conditions was in a reasonable state of dynamic balance. And so um, we can talk more about the details, but the sea level pressure field uh, on the right here, this is uh, with Joaquin removed. Everything else is pretty much similar. Um, and uh, we can look at some of the other fields. This shows the uh, an isosurface of ge geopotential height difference between the with and without uh, TC run and then the 700 millibar wind field and the 500 millibar height so you can sort of see where the storm is. So this cone uh, is basically we, we added that much height to make Joaquin go away and then the cyclonic wind field that you see there is what we removed and taking out Joaquin and then correspondingly we had to take out the warm core so uh, this shows the warm anomaly that we had to remove which to be hydrostatically consistent and if you make it cooler, then of course you're taking out water vapor. So this shows uh, the one, kilo, one gram per kilogram isosurface of water vapor that we removed. And this shows the three gram per kilogram isosurface. So, you know, if you, so we kept relative humidity constant and by removing the warm core, you reduce the vapor content. And so I think you can, I would argue that that's a legitimate uh, way to remove a certain amount of water vapor that is attributable to the tropical cyclone. So we dried it a little bit. So there's the, the one and the three. So here's, uh, I should have had some kind of dramatic build up to this. So here's, here's what happens without Joaquin. So you know it was such a favorable environment for tropical cyclogenesis and that really humid air mass. So something else kind of does try to spin up in here, but it never gets below 1,006 uh, millibars. But it was a very favorable environment for tropical cyclogenesis. So you know Joaquin wanted to form anyway because it was a very, low shear, high humidity situation. But if you look at the South Carolina area, you see some rain there, but then you notice, 
you know, things kind of get going a little bit farther north over North Carolina. So um, let's look at the precipitation totals, including the No Joaquin run. And lo and behold, Raleigh, North Carolina gets 15 inches of rain. So, um, you know, this, this is an interesting. So maybe, you know, Joaquin uh, you know, saved Raleigh and flooded South Carolina. Uh, but, you know, the, the point is, even without Joaquin, though, 15 inches of rain in four days is still an extreme precipitation. I mean, that would have caused a lot of flooding in North Carolina. But let's see if we can understand um, you know, what happened here. And uh, if we look, at, I probably won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just look at these upper panels first. You still see this sort of anticyclonic development, but without Joaquin's outflow, this isn't as aggressive, and so you don't thin or retard the movement of the upper trough as much. And ultimately, that means the whole system locates a little farther to the north and east than in the control simulation. So I think Joaquin's outflow shifted the location of the upper synoptic uh, flow features. And um, in the lower troposphere, without Joaquin, and this view I've slanted a little bit more, so when I show the, the PV and the, the moisture flux, it looks like it's offset. But you still have this band of diabetically produced PV, and you still have this low-level jet with the moisture flux now going into North Carolina. So that part of the story hasn't changed without Joaquin. And so uh, that's why you can still get a 15-inch rain event even without uh, Joaquin. Um, we can do the same kind of analysis, taking the cross-section in the same place. Of course, now everything is offset farther north. But when you do that, you know this is what we had with Joaquin. This is without Joaquin. You still have this diabetic lower PV maximum, a low-level jet. And actually, at, at an earlier time, this is almost as intense as there. At 72 hours, I think there was another level or two of shading in there. But it's overall not a drastically different story, and you still have that extreme precipitation. So without Joaquin, uh, the axis of heavy rainfall shifts to the north. Uh, you don't cross the 20-inch barrier in the simulation anymore. But you know, is this because of decreased moisture transport? Um, and the, again, the trough, I think we can see some evidence that the trough, uh, upper trough is propagating differently. And uh, that may be due to the weakened or the lack of upper level outflow from uh, Joaquin. So these, I don't want to, how am I doing for time? I think I don't want to uh, saturate you guys, no pun intended, saturate you guys with uh, moisture flux plots. But um, so here's the control simulation. You can see uh, this uh, humidity streaming into South Carolina. And then without Joaquin, um, you know, you still have this incredibly humid air mass, but you don't have Joaquin down here, but you still see a lot of moisture feeding into the southeast. And so, um, you know, how does it change? Well, we wanted to do, a, well, eventually have to do a complete moisture budget. But what we did to start with is, I was just sort of curious, you know, we took out the hurricane at the start, and so the domain average precipitable water diminished a little bit in the initial conditions. But you know, is the hurricane indeed a net moisture sink? And what you find is that when you take out the hurricane, if you look at the domain average precipitable water, for a lot of the simulation, or at least for the middle part of it, there's actually more vapor in the no TC run than there was with Joaquin, which is consistent with the lack of precipitation vapor removal. And, uh, and so there was kind of during the peak of the flooding event, there was actually more vapor in the TC run, and then it, there was less at the start and less at the end. Um, but you know, we wanted to really hone in on the flooding area. So if you make, draw a box that includes Georgia and the Carolinas and Southern Virginia and offshore waters and say, you know, so a box that incorporated both the control run flooding and the no TC run uh, precipitation events, and you look at the, um, the water vapor, the domain average precipital water in, those, in that area, what you see is that there's actually more water vapor in that area in the no TC run almost throughout the whole event. So, um, you know, maybe Joaquin isn't necessarily providing the moisture. That may not be its role in this as much as some of these other uh, aspects. Um, the domain average precipitation did go down a little bit from, 
maybe 75 or 76 millimeters over that whole area to maybe 70 millimeters. Um, so there was a reduction in precipitation. And so we did some uh, total water comparisons. And, uh, and we need, like I said, we haven't done a complete water budget yet, but that's next on our, our list. But you know, there's evidence here that um, there's more vapor without walking. So if we look at the moisture flux, I just have a couple of plots. Those previous plots were showing the mixing rate or the specific humidity. This shows the actual moisture flux. So you can see that really strong moisture flux and this sort of pivoted into North Carolina, whereas at this point it was more aimed to the south. So it's definitely different without Joaquin in there, but there's still a band of really intense moisture transport even without the system. And you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's the same story at hour 72, again, farther north. So um, what about the upper levels? This will be the last, uh, the last thing that I show. So the control run, again, on the left with this really nice jet and this jet entrance giving us the ascent over South Carolina. When you take out um, Joaquin, you don't build this ridge back as much with less upper level outflow. And so kind of you, you still get um, the strong ascent, but it's shifted to the north and east because this whole trough is sort of more uh, progressive. And I think this shows it better. So I put the circle or the oval in exactly the same place. And you can see with Joaquin, you know, you've, uh, you've built this ridge more. And so the trough is sort of shunted more to the south and west. And so the jet is sort of down here over uh, Georgia, whereas in the no TC run, all that pattern shifts to the north and uh, east because uh, the, the trough is more progressive. So to summarize um, what I've shown you so far, you know, Joaquin appears to have played several roles in this flooding event. It certainly had an influence on the location of the heavy rain in these simulations. Um, and the upper level outflow uh, contributed to thinning and slowing the progression of that upper trough over the southeast. And that had a lot to do with where that intense ascent, the forcing for ascent, was located. Um, however, even without Joaquin, we still had a heavy rainfall event in the Carolinas. And, um, and that really in intense uh, atmospheric river, I guess is what we would call it these days, you know, that's what, um, that was still there with kind of the same configuration even without, uh, without Joaquin. And the water vapor content was uh, similar with or without Joaquin, almost there, over the flooding area, there was actually more water vapor without Joaquin. So, um, you know, the fact that we were able to represent the precipitation even without capturing the full intensity of Joaquin, um, you know, is, is interesting because that tells us maybe that, you know, we didn't need to fully represent the system, although we need to address that. But it was interesting that that GFS run I showed you that made landfall in New Jersey, it actually produced, uh, it did a nice job with the forecast of heavy rain in South Carolina, even though it had Joaquin doing the wrong thing. So that also suggests some level of independence. Um, but I wonder, th this study, and we'd have to look at more cases, of course, but um, it, in, at least in this case, I think that the role of the, of the tropical cyclone was more in sort of arranging the upper synoptic pattern and that way the outflow jet was configured rather than supplying moisture to the event. And so um, that's kind of, this is one case, but that's the question that, that comes up in my mind. And we've done this for a few other cases and sort of had similar results that it's hard for hurricanes to export moisture, but I guess they, I'm open to the possibility that they can, but it's, uh, it's complicated. Um, and it's also difficult to sort of, I mean, this warm air mass that was in place with the 77 degree dew point in Raleigh, uh, that had nothing to do with Joaquin. And so that was the moisture that was available. So you can't really attribute that warm, humid air mass to Joaquin. It formed in it because it was a very favorable environment for a tropical cyclone uh, uh, to form in, but it didn't pr you know, provide it or create it. It probably enhanced evaporation in the vicinity of the storm though. That a lot of that precipitated out locally. So we need to do more. Um, we have higher resolution simulations that we haven't analyzed much yet and uh, those will better capture uh, the intensity of Joaquin. We also need to do a more complete moisture budget to really analyze the complete set of sources and sinks. Um, we also, you know, 
we have we had a good out of the box 36 kilometer run. Uh, maybe that was uh, fortuitous. Uh, maybe we we picked good uh, physical parameterizations or good initial conditions or, or WARF ARW is a really great model. But uh, whatever, we need to run some other configurations to kind of get a sense for the ensemble spread there. And uh, eventually we'll hopefully work on a paper to publish this. So any input or questions you guys have, uh, please uh, bring them on. Um, I'll wrap up a big list of acknowledgments, starting with Jamie and Greg for uh, hosting me and all of you for, for being here. And uh, there's a lot I know going on this week, so I appreciate your uh, spending some of your seminar CPU listening to me this morning. Uh, and uh, and I'll wrap up with a couple of references, too, if you're interested in reading some of these other papers that I mentioned. And then I'll go back to the summary, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, this is being uh, recorded, so uh, anybody who have a question, you're going to raise your hand and I'll uh, bring you the mic, please. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you analyzed those runs, earlier run initializations that made landfall, whether they had similar amounts of rain anyway, uh, or would the, if la landfall would have significantly increased the amount of rain. So how was the rainfall prediction for those runs? Yeah, and that's that's a good question, and we didn't really. I mean, I think uh, well, my my student Chris did those runs, and I think when we saw the the, the storm uh, track didn't verify well. Um, I don't think we deleted. They're probably sitting on a disk somewhere, but we didn't really analyze them much. But that's a good question because, and again, that would help establish to what extent the events were independent. And I mentioned the GFS, which made landfall in New Jersey. In fact, I think I do have a slide. Um, yeah, here's the GFS forecast from that run that hit New Jersey. It had 14 inches of rain with a terrible TC track. So um, that's maybe also telling. But yeah, we could go back and look at that, certainly. Yep. So you mentioned uh, the weak TC in the beginning, how it was weaker in the simulation set. Do you anticipate maybe if you went to higher resolution that you would get a stronger TC, but you'd still see the same uh, precipitation signature, or is it just too early to tell? Yeah, I, I mean, there's no question that and we do have the 12 and 4-kilometer uh, runs. I don't have the, um, the, the data. I didn't have it. I, we just finished, I just finished those a couple of weeks ago because my, my student left, so now I'm having to do everything. Uh, but, um, but it was definitely more intense, but I didn't look at the precip. I haven't had a chance to uh, to sink my teeth into it, but I'm sure it will be more intense, and you know, we'll see. Hopefully it won't break everything else, right, because right. Uh, if, you know, the precip event, we wouldn't want that to change a whole lot. <laughs> so. I'm just thinking, would it, would it cause it to go further south even? like in, Maybe it's maybe you're talking Georgia instead or something. Yeah, because right. then the outflow would be stronger, but I think you right. know, that upper level low can only be thinned and eroded so much, and so, you know, but yeah, that's certainly possible that by a stronger Joaquin could shunt the whole event even farther to the south and west as possible. Chris? Gary, so um, I'm wondering if, if it's useful to kind of reframe what the extreme event was here. I mean, we have a extreme flood, we have a intense tropical cyclone, but what maybe the extreme event was the generation of such an incredible amount of precipitable water in the atmosphere over a large scale that allowed all these other events, you know, at least to become possible. Because without that, it seems like none of this would, we wouldn't have a discussion about these events. So do you have a sense of what created such a large scale condition in the first place? It seems very atypical at this, this part of the season for this to just be another easterly wave or something like that. Yeah, that's a, a, a great point because really the that incredibly humid air mass hosted both the rainfall event and the tropical cyclone, and, and it moved into higher latitudes. The sea surface temperatures were warmer than average uh, across the, the Gulf Stream and in the, that whole area, and so that certainly was a factor. There, there's been a few other events like this that I've studied. Uh, we had one in 2010 uh, that was loosely associated with Tropical Storm Ida, where something similar happened. That produced flooding in North Carolina, but um, that in that case, it was sort of the this tropical moisture feed, the, the, a fairly large tropical air mass 
of unseasonable warmth and humidity moved into higher latitudes and you know i don't i haven't that's a great question i don't have a good answer in terms of looking at sort of the looking farther back in time and over larger spatial scales but that's a, an important point because that that may be the true uh you know the true cause of this was what uh precipitated that so yeah that's something we can look into i think that uh, that's a, i like the recasting it back to where did the anomaly that, that led to these things come from but i'm sure that the warm water had had some contribution um so i noticed that we did have similar precipitation events with and without Joaquin, but the extreme, very extreme precipitation didn't seem to be present without Joaquin. Do you, would you say that's attributable to model uncertainty or just maybe effect from the hurricane? Yeah, I think your your point about the model uncertainty really what we you know what we've increasingly been doing in recent years is sort of running a mini ensemble on both sides of the experiment so that you get a sense for you know, was it just a certain uh, combination of model physics that gave you that one outcome? So I think that's also on the list to, you know, run uh, at least a kind of a mini physics ensemble to see if the ensemble mean shows that same, uh, you know, that same characteristic. I, my guess is it will, but until we do it, we, we won't know for sure. But your, your point's well taken. Uh, one second, wait, can I ask one yeah, topic sure. question too? Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on two other potential influences on this one. Um, first of all, orography, since you're pushing all that moisture up into the Appalachians at least a little bit. And then a second one is uh, I think it's extremely interesting how you can do s sort of remove a TC from the whole background. But that cold air damming event almost looks as interesting to me. I would almost say that our Colorado flood had some, some similarities in there. We had a, a definite uh, a northeast flow uh, come down and, and, and stall basically the precipitation in the place where it was for so long and it looks like this might have happened in this case too. Um, that's a 1044 high uh, in the Great Lakes. That's a big, that's a pretty big high at that time. Can you actually do anything to almost remove or decrease the strength of the high to study the cold air uh, or the, 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 the convergence feature that sets up in South Carolina? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another great question. Um, I mean, certainly we we've done enough runs where we've removed you know, flattened terrain and and rerun and without the cold air damming. But that 1044 high, I mean that the I think there was more than cold air damming. I think even without the Appalachian Mountains, you still would have seen that cold front push in and push offshore. So, you know, we could try to remove the cold air damming influence effect uh, by flattening the mountains, I mean, it, we, this is something we do routinely, uh, you know, playing God with the model atmosphere. Um, but removing the 1044 high would be harder. We we could do it. We would have to uh, weaken the upstream dynamical features that led to its. Uh, so that might require initializing at an even earlier time, which makes it even harder to get the you know get things right in the southeast. But um, yeah, certainly that's with PV inversion, anything is possible, and that would be interesting to look at because uh, that was a player. More classic 1028 high than a 1044 high, just to weaken it a bit, but I don't know if that, these things are possible. Yeah, it's, it's definitely possible, um, but yeah, it, it, there's a lot of different players, and you know, we could take out the system over the upper level system over the southeast, and then nothing would have happened, yeah, probably. There, or maybe we'd have had a major hurricane landfall, you know, in the Carolinas. So, you know, but at some point, you know, it's. You, know, you can't answer all of these questions. A simple question. Uh, uh, just wondering if your model run is uh, uh, the 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 com oh, wow well, doesn't matter. The thirty six model uh, kilometer model run was driven by forecast boundary condition or analysis boundary condition. It was yeah. So it was a simulation and not a forecast. So we used the GFS analyses, but the, the lateral boundaries are pretty far away. But that certainly helped. So it, it wasn't a fair comparison. To, to say that that was what a forecast we we could have run a forecast actually it'd be interesting to see um, if we'd use GFS forecast lateral boundary conditions I'm sure it would have hurt the performance at least to some extent but th th this was a simulation and not a forecast so yeah that's uh, I tried to use that word to differentiate but I should have pointed that out it's a good point okay if I'm correct yeah, oh, we'll go with one more question yeah sure last one 
maybe it maybe it fits as a last question uh, because uh, it may be a little bit provocative but uh, if if i would be a decision taker of an insurance company paying either 12 billion dollars as a uh, damage repair yes no i would probably now ask you the question what did we learn should we pay is it so was it was this damage now uh, tropical cyclone related yes no yeah, that, that's a provocative uh, question, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and, and thankfully, to date, no insurance company has approached me as a... Uh, that, that, that would be a volatile position to be in. So, Cut the recording, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a, it's a great question. I mean, we, it appears that Joaquin influenced the location of this event and, and increased its intensity a little bit. So, um, you know, some, in that sense... You know the people that were flooded in South Carolina can attribute. Uh, you know there, there's some causality there, but how the insurance company. You know you wouldn't tropical cyclone insurance didn't uh, cover that. So, uh, but they don't know about. It. So maybe when we publish our paper, maybe they'll they'll try to uh, change things around. But that's yeah, that's the the billion dollar question. <laughs> the twelve billion dollar question is, yeah, you know, how does that work with the insurance industry? Uh, but I think, yeah, I, I like the way Chris put it. You know, the the anomalous there, the anomalous feature really was this incredibly humid air mass. I and mean, when you have that kind of humidity moving into uh, higher latitudes, you know, something big is going to happen somewhere. And so that's probably the ultimate culprit. And um, you know, the the details um, maybe don't matter as much. But in a practical sense, that's a very good question that I'm sure financial sector would love to have answered better than I can answer it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll punt on your provocative question, but that, that is a good, uh, good way. And thank you all for attending and for the excellent questions. Thank you, everyone, once again, please. And